amazing what some people will do to avoid eating by themselves. But what other obsessions have South Koreans got these days? South Korea's signature cherry blossom returns to the so-called land of the morning calm. But right now, this is a restless country where traditional values are being challenged. On my journey around the Korean peninsula, I'll start in the capital Seoul, where the new cool is all about old school, hip-hop moves, not K-pop schmooze. And is this food porn? Why online dining companions have become Korea's new cult TV stars? Then I head north to put one foot literally into enemy territory. I can now actually walk into North Korea before flying into the country's island getaway, where grandmothers, not young men, are the traditional hunter-gatherers. Finally, it's up towards the mountains to find out how South Korea is determined its very own martial art will kick kung fu and karate out of sight. Seoul, the capital of South Korea, is a teeming city, home to more than 11 million people. That's nearly a quarter of the country's population. It's also the hub of an amazing economic transformation that began after the horrors inflicted on it in the Second World War. The story of Korea goes back thousands of years, of a country always fighting off outside pressure to preserve its own identity. After partition in 1948 and then invasion two years later from the north, the USA stepped in smartly in the first significant Cold War conflict. And today, the American influence on popular culture and consumerism is impossible to ignore. Decades of mind-boggling modernization have led to South Korea enjoying way faster internet connectivity than the rest of the world. And that affects all aspects of everyday life, like shopping. At this Future World showroom in Seoul, you can choose clothes that fit perfectly without even having to try them on. OK, now you are done body scanning, mm -hmm. and then we're going to scan your face. Look at the camera, please. Three seconds. It's my fashion case. Okay, right. And now you can choose a hairstyle, the one you want to try. I can, can have hair. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I should be looking at the clothes, but I'm looking at that face with hair. It's oh. incredible. And the pose. You look very good on this fading screen as well. And with long hair too, you look very good. Not sure about the catwalk pout though. Won Suk Chin is a film director who, after 15 years in New York, has returned to a very different motherland. Status and glamour are very much part of the new soul scene here, but Won Suk sees deeper, more significant changes in modern-day South Korea. When I was in the West, people talk about the decline of the Western civilization. They talk about death of cinema. They talk about death of everything. Here, we're looking at a rosy future. And I love that, that sense of optimism here. 992, that's awesome. While Wansuk was making films in the US, South Korea was exporting its own brand of film, soap opera and music to the rest of the world as part of a popular culture movement called Hallyu. It's been successful, but not to everyone's taste. 
In recent years, Korea has become well known for a very heavily manufactured, branded, even sugary kind of music called K-pop. However, there is another contemporary art form in which this country is genuinely a world leader. Breakdancing, or b-boying, originated on the streets of New York in urban American communities in the 1980s. But in recent times, it's been adopted more eagerly by South Koreans. This crew are now recognised as one of the world's best. Korean b-boys are known for being very much technical. They have a lot of difficult moves. So uh, they became you know, very famous for that really quick. The Drifters crew consist of 14 members, half of whom are full-time and teach dance here too. Today, b-boying is more than a dance fad in Korea. It's an art form that's constantly evolving. And that's attracting people from all around the world to come and witness it firsthand. So how does it fit into the whole K-pop scene for which South Koreans have become so well known? We started making this noise with you know, K-pop and Korean culture. Personally, I wouldn't I don't really see that as Korean culture. It's just pure entertainment. Somehow we found a way to please people overseas with this, with this entertainment business. K-pop, for us, I, I think it, ultimately it's a business. Uh, you know, they sell music. On the other hand, we are not really trying to sell this. We think this is for you know, everyone to be shared. This is a one. That's a one. Yeah. And two. Back to one, two. Are you ready? The Drifters crew are like a tight family, and social bonds like these are beginning to replace the traditional family unit. The obsession with achieving high career status has also pushed family down the list of priorities for many of the younger generation. We live in a very confusing time. I think the older generation will still believe in the community, will still believe in that family thing. But uh, now, uh, I think that that unit is uh, somewhat uh, collapsing. Um, a lot of young kids are now living alone. The old-fashioned family units may be under threat, but what about communal dining? Food remains very central to the Korean way of life. Let's face it, we all like someone to share a meal with, don't we? Well, here they think they come up with the answer to that. It's called mukbang, which translates as eating broadcasts. Some people label it food porn. Jun Young is a music teacher, 28 years old and living with her parents and elder sister in an apartment on the outskirts of Seoul. How did you actually start doing this programme? How did it all begin? Well, I couldn't understand before why people were watching eating programs, but my friends said they were interesting. One day I found myself watching it all through the night, then my sister asked me why I was watching the program. She said, you like to cook and eat a lot, why don't you do the program? And so she did. Now, four nights a week, she broadcasts online to lonely viewers who now have an instant pop-up dining partner. Sometimes she cooks her own food. Sometimes she orders a takeaway. Sometimes it's both. After all, there's four hours of airtime to fill a night. 
It's minutes before tonight's transmission starts. John Young is not the only one doing this. Around the country, thousands of others are about to host their own similar shows. Does she ever wonder, though, why it's become so popular? I think it's mainly to get vicarious satisfaction. Many people are on a diet in Korea, so they get satisfied by watching me eat. Don't some people say to you, this is really weird? Yes, that's exactly what I thought when I first started. But people who watch this program really enjoy it. Do you think, in a way, it's a kind of therapy for some people? Yes, some say they are depressed, but I make them feel better and I cheer them up. <laughs> but while South Korea grapples with the consequences of its rapid transformation, shadows from its past refuse to go away. Drive north from Seoul, and one overwhelming historical legacy looms larger than ever. We're now less than 20 kilometers from the border between North and South Korea. And not so long ago, these peaceful surroundings were the scenes of tremendous military aggression from both sides. Four million people died in a short but brutal war here between North and South Korea. Today, there's a buffer zone, four kilometers wide and 240 kilometers long cutting Korea in half along the 38th parallel. It's one of the eeriest places on Earth, and rather bizarrely, it's also one of the world's most popular tourist attractions. They even have a theme park dedicated to it. Hyundae was injured by shrapnel at the age of eight when the Korean War broke out. His family left to live abroad. 30 years later, he's come back from Brazil for the first time. I feel heavy-hearted and saddened since we can't cross the border and see each other because of ideological conflict. That's heart-wrenching. When you come here, it almost looks like a theme park. Do you think it's respectful enough of the situation between the two countries? Rather than just watching the borderline, I think it's great to have fun with children, which is a sort of expression of free democracy. This is the most fortified border in the world, separating probably one of the poorest countries on the planet with one of the richest. South Korea is by no means perfect, of course, with the government and big business blighted by corruption and poverty surprisingly high amongst the elderly. But stories about repression, concentration camps and poor living conditions in the country opposite are notorious. So those of you standing on my left are now standing in commerce North Korea, while those on my right are still relatively safe within the Republic of Korea. But nonetheless, as the military march line is not effective in this building, you may make a crossing in North Korea safely and freely. Right now, I'm in what's called a blue room, and this line here exactly is the division between South and North Korea. I can now actually walk into North Korea. The only other way of doing that would be for me to go back to Seoul, fly to Beijing in China, from there go to the capital of North Korea, and then come all the way around here again. Just outside, tank traps, mines, electrical fences and armies are in full battle readiness. South Korean soldiers stand in taekwondo stance. It's in many ways, I think, tragic, absurd and yet fascinating. I mean, technically, the two countries are still at war. Is that That's right, sir. So this is only an armistice screen, this is not a, a peace agreement.
In spite of the big changes forced on South Korea by geopolitics, some age-old traditions remain, especially away from the big cities. The country's biggest island, Jeju in the south, is where South Koreans and many Japanese tourists come to ski in the winter and enjoy the beautiful coastline in the summer. It's also home to one of Korea's most fascinating and enduring traditions. Meet the women divers, or henyu, of Jeju, a skill that's been part of the island's culture since the 17th century. The youngest woman here is 54, the oldest in her 80s. The trawl begins for sea urchins, abalones, shellfish, octopus and conch. In a good week, the women here can earn up to $200. Money, however, is not the primary motive. Soon Nyo is 66, and she started diving when she was 15. We're not born with these skills. We weren't good at the beginning, but as we keep doing it, we get better and better. They can go down as low as 15 meters, holding their breath for up to two minutes at a time. Now, for these women, it's just a job. But I think what a fantastic feat of human endurance, considering some of these people are in their 80s. Now, originally, men deemed it too lowly a job for them to be doing. But the fact is, women do it far better. There are only one or two male divers here. Women are better than men at this, as they swim a lot, from the moment they are born. And they make such an effort to be good at it. Men swim for fun, not for business. But the sad thing is, is that this is a dying craft, with many young people preferring to pursue more contemporary career paths. In 1950, there were 30,000 registered henyu. Today, it's around 3,000, and all of them are in their later years. I believe that henyu has value globally. I hope that we can preserve this practice permanently. That's our desire. It's a shame that the number of henyu are on the decline. Some four hours later, and the divers are back, their nets bulging with the fruits of their labor. Getting around South Korea by air is possible with a few domestic carriers to choose from, but high-speed intercity train travel is the most relaxed and efficient way. So it's time to get on board the 8.30 a.m. West Gold train on the way to the town of Muju. But as I'm about to find out, this is no ordinary train journey. Because on this train service, your feet get extra special attention too. In a special foot spa cubicle. But my chilled out state doesn't last for long. Because just a few yards away, a party has just begun. Is this really happening at 8.45 in the morning? On a train? Fact is, performing and entertainment are woven into everyday social life. And from one Korean passion... ..to another. Taekwondo. Since Sydney 2000, Taekwondo has been an Olympic sport and the government has spent millions of dollars promoting it and setting up dedicated schools overseas. There are now 206 member nations. And then there's this. Less than a year old, this complex called Take One Don One is a huge state-of-the-art shrine to the martial art. With regular demonstrations like this, it's hoped kids will be sucked in by the athleticism and drama of the sport. 
But according to Q Jin, who's just come back from Brazil on a mission to raise awareness of Taekwondo, there's a lot more to it than smashing wooden blocks. Uh, Taekwondo is different from other sports. Yes, Taekwondo places more importance on respect for masters than on technique, unlike other martial arts. There are five essential spirits of Taekwondo. They are courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control and indomitable spirit. The most important is courtesy. Taekwondo is like making a deadly weapon with our body that's only used with good intentions. Q Jin believes that Taekwondo is the kind of Korean culture that the world should know about. Now, K-pop is a big hit around the world. I believe the so-called Korean wave has originated from Taekwondo. With the same mindset, the government's paying great attention to Taekwondo, with the creation of things like this park and the training of Taekwondo masters and players. Punch or kick? Time for me to give it a go. <laughs> but there's nothing like one-to-one -one tuition with a black belt master. So I've reached the end of my journey through South Korea and it's become pretty obvious to me that this country is on an accelerated path to asserting itself on the world stage. It's a journey not without its problems. Old institutions like the traditional family unit and corporate dynasties are under threat. And the fault line between communism and capitalism along the 38th parallel that divides Korea is as deep and volatile as ever. It's amazing. Oh, I'll do that again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but I've met a lot of young people on this trip, and they seem confident about the future of their country. And let's face it, with the prosperity and the efficiency this country enjoys, they've got every right to be.